Hey, everyone. Welcome to part two of our episode with Dr. Jonathan Ahn from the University of Washington. In part one, we kind of talked about uh, John's journey to doing a DDS PhD and how he got interested in research on the biology of aging. And now we're back for part two, where we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the mechanisms that are connecting aging and biology of aging with oral health and the diseases of um, the oral cavity that go along with age, like periodontal disease or salivary dysfunction or, or even oral cancers. All right. So, I mean, I think, again, you know, this just this discussion just illustrates what to me is a very sort of frustrating um, divide between health of the mouth and health of the rest of the body and how in biomedical research and in medical care, you know, we really don't pay that much attention right. to oral health, which seems really dumb to me. Right. But that's right. sort of the reality. And so I think um, hopefully, you know, as people become more informed, people will start to recognize that there is this really important connection yeah. between oral health and 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 health everywhere else. Yeah. And so, you know, thinking along those lines, I know, you know, many people who watch this uh, podcast are very interested in, you know, optimizing health as much as they can. Mm -hmm. What sort of tips do you have as a practicing dentist who also, mm -hmm. you know, is deep in the biology of aging? Like, yeah. what can people do to yeah. give themselves the best shot at maintaining or or improving their oral health? Yeah, um, I, I think the first thing is just being aware of, I, and I don't know how feasible this is, but just aware of where the good science is, right? So even now, I have patients in the dental clinic because this field, this aging field and neuroscience has become, you know, near mainstream or is mainstream now in terms of people trying to optimize their health. And so people will come in and ask me as a dentist, like, how is this going to affect my oral health? How you is mean this? like things that they've heard about that might affect right, right, longevity? Might, exactly right. And so there's definitely interest there. And to me, I think that's great as a, as, as a dentist and also in this field, because that's what really drives our profession to kind of really seek out research questions. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. The people who ask you that, are they also doing the basics? That's the thing. They aren't either. So it's just, it's literally <laughs> just, hey, uh, I am. I heard that this thing helps with yeah. health and I know you do research here. Yeah. Does it help? And, yeah. I, you know, and so I think the point I'm trying to make in terms of optimizing longevity is understand where the good science is first, right? Like um, I could tell you, oh, you got to get new fillings and all this stuff, but it, you know, I'm not going to tell you that, but um, just understand where the good data is, understand the good science, right? That's number one. Uh, number two is ask questions, right? Um, and, and again, this is not going into oral health, but I think it starts from the basics, like you were saying, just asking really good questions, asking, you know, a dentist who may understand kind of some of these, you know, um, it doesn't have to be with longevity. Some of the systemic responses, like, does your dentist understand the medication you're taking mm. and the oral complications? Now, when you say yeah. medication, right, you're talking about medications for, from a, that a medical doctor is Exactly, right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, now, that's interesting. Yeah, so, most people aren't even going to think of that. Yeah. So even your dentist, like for our, our clinic, if a patient comes in, the first thing I look at is their medication because it yeah. already gives me a uh, health profile, right? So, yeah. You know, are they, you know, do they have cardiovascular disease? You know, do they have, you know, um, uh, fluid retention that's happening? Uh, do they have diabetes, right? And I already know kind of the oral complications that may develop, right? Mm. Um, and so um, I, I think it starts from the basics. Like even that, just finding, being able to, you know, communicate and understanding just kind of what oral health impact is. Like if you're taking medication that causes really, really low saliva, your dentist should be able to understand that, okay, you know, so and so has low saliva. So we're gonna have to think about, you know, maybe an extra cleaning, or we're gonna think about high fluoride toothpaste. We're gonna think about maybe letting them, guiding them yeah. that, hey, you have low saliva. Continue. Did you know you have low saliva? And most of the time, patients don't. They're, they'll, first thing I see, first thing I hear is, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I started noticing that, right? So, so it's kind of like find a good dentist, right? And, yeah. and I mean, that goes the same way for a medical doctor. And, exactly. and this is one of the challenges I get asked all the time. Like, right. how do I find a good doc? Right. Yeah. So, so I, I think, it, you know, now with information available, I think it's just the information. Yeah. Like it, so let me ask you this, because I know a lot of people are becoming um, uh, more skilled at finding information about health mm -hmm. and usually in the rest of their body. Are there any good resources, and it's fine if, if you can't mm -hmm. think of any, because mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but are there any good resources out there that help people know what to right. look for in right. the in the oral health uh, yeah. area? Um, 
unless you go talk to your dentist, no. But um, I don't well, know but then I, you got to find a dentist who right, who right. who is in this space, right? So I don't so know. It sounds could, like there's a need here. Maybe yeah. maybe you need to start your own YouTube channel. I could start my YouTube. <laughs> I, although I don't know if I could plug this in, but I was asked to think about a book ah. that may end up. Ah, that, that would be doing. great. So fantastic. Um, so we're kind of talking. I'm I'm chatting with a few people and seeing if there's a book related to. I that. think and, there's a book there. Yeah. So it, and it's not just because dentistry. I think you know, and I was telling. Um, um, early on too, but you know, it's the one place where you're kind of trusting the doctor, you're awake and you're kind of trusting the professional on the other side to do yeah. their work. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Everything else, uh, even surgery. And it's scary to yeah, a lot of people. Because because you have no idea yeah. and you're awake, right? <laughs> and so uh, in that area, you know, there's a lot of things that even I think sometimes dentists aren't quite aware of, you know, what can happen yeah. because there's just so much information out there. Yeah. So I, I think Yes, a book is needed, and um, that is something maybe sometime next year we're kind of thinking about maybe just. Cool. Um, well, I, I hope you do that. That'd yeah, be yeah. fantastic. But, uh, but um, so uh, what so, about what about just general practices people yeah, can do? I mean, yeah. I know it's some of it may be kind of obvious, but I still think it's right, worth right. saying, right? So, what do you recommend? So brush. How often? Brush at least twice a day. Okay. Um, definitely brush one time in the morning uh, just because uh, at night all that microbiome is kind of, you know, and, and there's a lot of also like other debates on that, but brush in the morning. Uh, also for your colleagues. And, and do you well. recommend things like Sonicare or or, or yeah. those kind of uh, devices? Great question. So so I get that a lot. Like is electric toothbrush better, manual toothbrush better? Frankly, if you do a good job, like people can use a Sonicare or an Oral-B and they are not good at it. It's Got just it. not going to do anything. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, either or that actually does. I think a good the job one thing you. those have built into them is the time. Right. Right. right so right, as right. long as you use that, not everybody's going to use right, it. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, after a while, you know, once you get the rhythm and down, you yeah. know, kind of, you know, what to do. Yeah. Um, so um, electric or um, a regular t- uh, manual toothbrush is fine. Um, you know, flossing, obviously, you know, make sure to floss How often? for your gum health. Uh, one, every time you brush, you should at least be flossing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, for some patient, uh, for some people, you know, like something like a water pick also helps, especially if you have those, you know, crowns with bridges and you can't just get that floss under, you know, uh, just anything to kind of clean the biofilm off, uh, just kind of keep things healthy. Um, and frankly, just going to your dentist and then um, and then going to your dentist and getting routine checks, right? Yeah. And, and the checks, uh, sorry, the checks are not more of, oh, are you, do you have a cavity or not? Um, because dentistry is just not about teeth. It's about, you know, is it, do you have a potential lesion for oral cancer? Mm-hmm. Do you have right. something for your lip? Right. You know, how is, you know, these medications working out? There's a lot more to your oral health visit than just the tooth, right? right. Um, and, and something that we're implementing now is also kind of looking at your bite, right? Like how is your bite doing? Right. You know, th- with technology now, there's so much information that we can, we I can see with just your teeth, yeah, uh, and that I understand exactly how your teeth trajectory is going to go if we don't, you know, be proactive on certain things. That's or whatnot, interesting. Right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm this is just my perception, but it seems to me like more and more dentists are both picking up on tooth grinding and making recommendations. Right. For a mouth guard at night is that yeah. is that just something that that I'm misperceiving or is that reality? Yeah. So, um, uh, so guard, so mouth guards or some any devices um, can help. I think the misconception and and you know I you know I could be wrong too in terms of you know that misconception if there is, but I've seen a lot of that and they say, oh, you need a night guard, you need this, you need a guard. If you grind that at night, you need a guard, right? Because you got to protect the teeth. Um, any device, like let's say you do have some grinding patterns, right? The guard is there not to prevent you from grinding at night. It's to actually give your teeth a little break from hitting each other. Right. Right. That That's the only reason. So you could wear that guard during the day. You could wear that guard at night. And everybody's going to have some grinding patterns. So, um, I, you know. So you think it might have, it might be partly that it's being picked up on more, but partly that it's just become more perceived right dentists right, are right, looking right, right. for it now right right and, well, i mean and, i'm not saying that's a bad thing no but. no no but i mean i'm gonna you know i'm a dentist too but yes i agree there are some times when we, we do over prescribe that just because they're grinding I right because i can tell you most people are going to have some grind patterns and yeah. and now and and you could actually get some of these devices or guards o- online yeah right? so you could take a mold and whatever but um, at the end of the day it's like you know do you really need it and and the most important thing is okay if you are grinding and you're actively grinding 
how do I stop doing that, right? right. Is the guard really going to help me fix what I'm doing? Or is there some underlying cause for that grinding? Well, let me ask you, what is yeah. the problem with grinding if you've fixed the damage to the teeth? Are there, In other words, are there other uh, yeah. problems associated sure. with grinding your teeth at night or clenching yeah. your jaw or whatever? Yeah, so um, obviously... Uh, the number one reason, right, grinding is that you are wearing away the tooth. Yeah, or damaging right. fillings or other things exactly, right. that damaging you may have had done in the past. Exactly, yeah, so damaging fillings. And then the thing with teeth is that they, once you grind it away, there's that 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 space that happens between the teeth and the upper tooth. So you grind it away, right? And our teeth like our neighbors. So it'll start either dropping to find the other tooth. Oh, I see. And so there's that, mm. you know, so there's that bite relationship that does happen. So, um, and the grinding itself, it's not necessarily grinding, but it could be like the nighttime where you have the muscles activated, or it could just be the way you're biting, right? So if you have a little rotation on the tooth, maybe it's not ideal. So you're just habitually you're just chewing food, you're just or chewing whatever. food and you're just grinding it away because hmm. it's not an ideal spot. Yeah. Right? Um, so I think you just have to, it goes back to your kind of earlier comment about, we just have to go back to the basics. Like, yeah. Yeah, everybody grinds, but are we going to fix the reason why it's going grinded or are we just going to put, you know, a little bandage over it and just call it, hey, I just wear this at night, right? right? So I think that's where the communication needs to be there. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, what about cold sensitivity? Is that something people should be worried about? Does that mean yep. anything? Because I know a lot of people have that, you know, they drink yep. something cold and like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. a little bit. So many times that's caused by, um, so there's multiple layers in your tooth. So the enamel is the hardest part of your tooth. And then the dentin, which is like the softer part. And uh, the dentin usually has um, these tubules that run down that kind of transmit signals, like pressure signals and everything to the nerve. So the sensitivity usually happens is the, uh, the theory is that the sensitivity triggers some of those nerves inside those tubules and that causes that sensitivity. So, and it, it just goes away, right? And it, because you could either go away by if you put your tongue on there. Um, so little tidbit, if you have brain freeze, for example, from ice cream, just put your tongue and there's a little, uh, right behind your two incisors, there's a little kind of a bulb right there, right behind there. If you have brain freeze, you just put your tongue right there and the brain freeze will slowly go <laughs> really? away. Because the wow. nerves go into that. that, right? So <laughs> Learn something anyway, new. <laughs> so uh, the sensitivity part, yeah. So uh, because the dentin is exposed, and that does happen when you get older too, because the enamel layer thins out as you get older. So people say, oh, my teeth are getting more amber or more yellow. It's just the dentin being exposed, right? So, and so is that is that something to be concerned about or are you just kind of... And that goes back to it. If you're a little bit older, it's unfortunately just kind of, it could be age related. It could be recession related. Uh, anything it, to do about it? So there are toothpaste that you could get. And these toothpaste have um, compounds that kind of block those tubules off to kind of, kind of hold off the sensitivity. Hmm. Um, other times, if it's recession related, for example, your dentist uh, can put little fillings in that area just to oh, prevent okay. that from happening. Um, and many times, you know, you get sensitive, you know, one day and then after a few days yeah. it goes away. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's, you could be proactive and just put fillings on everything, but we just kind right. of, you know, hmm. kind of monitor things on that. Yeah. Okay, so we could keep asking dentistry yeah. questions all day. So, I mean, if anybody has questions, put them in the comment section. Yeah. We'll have John back on to come answer all your, your dentistry questions. I think, you know, one question would be, how does somebody know if they have, if they've kind of nailed it, if they've gotten their oral health where it needs to be? Like, what yeah. What would you look for? I mean, obviously, absence of cavities, right, sure. and things like right. that. Right. But um, I, I think there's different gradations of that right so so like you said like first is you got no cavities no gum disease right and um there's a point and and many of probably the viewers are at this point too or maybe not but where you just go to the dental office and it becomes routine yeah it's just routine right like um and if your dentist dentist has like um kind of these newer scanners which i know uh, the optispan is now implementing in their um kind of their uh, clinical pipeline, uh, but if they have one of these scanners, the bite looks okay. Right, and this is the like the iTero that gives you a yep. three dimensional view of the inside of the yeah, mouth. I'm sorry, yeah, inside of the mouth. Um, call it like digital impression, and we could look at your bite. Um, uh, there's functions on there where you could um, assess kind of if there's cavities in there. Um, but um, there's a point where everything is just stable, where it's just routine, right? Um, um, I think at that point you're kind of like, okay, we're in a good spot, right? Okay. Um, does that happen often? There's always little things that happen. And that's when we have to be proactive about your oral health, right? So you might have a filling for 50 years or 40 years. That might be perfectly fine. But if your dentist doesn't really evaluate that carefully and there's a small chip, small fracture in that filling, and you're not proactive about it, you might have a point where now it's not stable, where it just breaks. 
breaks off with the tube. So um, even if you are at a stable point, you always have to consistently manage that yeah. um, by going to your dentist, having right. them evaluate, check. And x-rays is you know just one part of that whole gamut of um, um, evaluations that you're going to have to do. Yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on x-rays since you, since you brought it up? I yep. mean, I, every time I know that I go to the dentist and they want to do an x-ray, I kind of push back a little bit yeah, and yeah, say, yeah. Yeah. we really need to do that? It seems like... Yeah. I mean, again, maybe I'm wrong. I don't mean mm. to insult any dentists, no, no. but it seems like dentists are pretty cavalier about radiation. Is yeah, that, am well, I right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were cavalier for a lot of things. I mean, you know, I mean, we were we were doing dentistry without gloves. You know, you know, at a certain point in our in, in the time period where we weren't wearing masks, we weren't wearing gloves, yeah, sure. and we we're doing fillings. Sure. But um, so X-rays are important to uh, diagnose, obviously, bone loss, yeah. diagnose um, potential cavities. Um, any fillings that might have leakage, kind of you can kind of see on the X-rays or cavities. Um, I don't know what other dentists do, but I'll tell you kind of what I do with, especially uh, a patient who may be stable, is if we have a an X-ray from last year, and we take that iTero scan every year, if there's no issue with the X-ray itself, and I'm doing my clinical evaluation, then and I have an iTero scan. Usually, if they are pushed back on it, I'll say, yeah, that makes sense yeah. to me, right? And that's what I was going to ask is, can yeah. these sort of new technologies start to replace at least some of what you use x-rays yeah, for? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, so if, if like, for example, if you were at very low risk of dental cavities, right, and you're like, oh, you know, I don't want to get my x-rays today. In my mind, I'm like, well, last year we took x-rays. year before that we took x-rays. There's nothing going on. I take a scan. I'm like, well, all your feelings look okay. And I do my clinical exam. Yeah, yeah. yeah we could just wait till next cool. year. But year before, let's say there was a big cavity or year before you had something, right? And there's a, a consistent, you know, high risk of that, then x-rays, absolutely. Got it. Um, even, even if you don't want to, you know, we, we try to explain why we need to take the x-rays. But, and this goes back to the knowledge now people have, the information people have, because you're right. If in the 20s and 30s, you never had dental cavities, right? Does it really make sense to get x-rays every single time you go in? Frankly, for me, like, depending on kind of your practice style, I don't, I don't really necessarily see that, but if it'd been a few years, I would definitely recommend kind of sure. doing that. But that makes um, sense. technology wise, yeah, like it won't replace everything, but it can. Cool. Yeah. Check out part three in the link below to learn more about longevity interventions impacting oral health and more.